Hey friends, how's it going? Today we're going to talk about my favorite thing after anime cats laying in bed like a degenerate and rice. Online courses. I love online courses. I think the introduction of MOOCs has completely changed the playing field. It used to be that only people who could afford to go to elite universities could have access to certain information that allowed them to both better themselves and access certain opportunities. Of course, playing fields are definitely not completely even, but with MOOCs, they are far more level now. It's now completely possible for you to even learn an entire career and get a job just from online courses that are either free or cost as low as $10. I think that's just incredible. However, just because all of these wonderful resources are out there doesn't mean that people know how to use them effectively. In fact, on average, only 10% of users complete an online course. And I would think if you ask how many of those people actually went on to significantly incorporate what they learn in their real day-to-day -day lives, that number is probably even lower. As you can see, the issue these days is not so much access to information. It's your ability to actually learn the information and hopefully do something with it. So in this video, I'm going to share with you how I self-study using online courses and how to not give up two thirds of the way in or even less. I'm going to be heavily applying concepts from two of my favorite books, Ultra Learning and Four Disciplines of Execution, or DX for short. So I highly recommend you also check out these books after the video as well. All right, so step one is of course finding an online course, right? Wrong. This is usually mistake number one. Step number one is actually having a clear picture of your end goal, or in other words, a good reason for learning a new skill and slash or leveling up your skill set with the online courses. People tend to not have very good reasons for doing things. And I think you'll be surprised by the answers people would give you when you ask them why they're doing the things that they're doing. Oftentimes they either don't know, have reasons inherited from someone else, usually their parents, or just clearly haven't thought it through and just default to a generic reason. Here are some examples of bad reasons. Tina, why do you want to be a doctor? My mom told me to. Why do you want to be a data scientist? Well, making six figures sounds sounds awesome. And um, I think machine learning sounds, sounds like a pretty cool job. Hey, to be clear, I'm not judging you for wanting money at all. In fact, that is one of the major reasons why I did a CS master's and chose my career. But I just want to dig a little bit deeper. What you want is probably not just to see a million dollars sitting in your bank account. It's what money buys. Now, that is your actual reason. How do you envision your life a few years down the line and how does learning this new skill help you achieve that? For example, my reason for choosing computer science and then data science is freedom. Intellectual freedom to use my skills and apply them to different industries that I find interesting. And of course, financial freedom. I'm very much into the FIRE movement and I see this skill set as a way of enabling me to get there. Now, it also doesn't have to be a super grand and outwardly visible reason. For example, I'm learning trading because I think it's quite thrilling to potentially lose all my money uh, and potentially make a lot of money and I also find a psychology going on in markets just really interesting and one day I also want to learn how to paint because I've just always wanted to which I think is a great reason in itself okay so I'm gonna stop harping on this point but I really encourage you to just think about your reason for trying to learn this new skill even better if you can picture how this skill you're trying to learn will enrich your life in a tangible way so you might ask why is this even important well, it's because it serves two crucial purposes in your self-studying journey. Number one is if you have a clear reason and a goal, you have a North Star to aim for, and you're able to customize the online course or courses to achieve your goal more quickly while skipping through things that are irrelevant to you. Because after all, there is no online course that will just perfectly help you achieve your goals. And it is up to you to put together your own syllabus. And number two is having a reason and a goal serves as motivation when the abyss stares back at you. Okay, so step number two is finding the online course. Ultra Learning gives us a good guideline for how long we should spend on finding the correct resource, which is 10% of the time you think it will take for you to go through the entire learning process. Too many people fall into this trap of analysis paralysis when comparing all the different types of resources there are and not being able to decide between the huge array of online courses to choose from. So the TLDR here is that you probably wouldn't go wrong with just choosing a course that is rated highly on MOOC platforms like Udemy and Coursera. There's generally good reason for why they're rated highly, but if you can't bring yourself to just trust me, which is great because you should never trust random people on the internet. For all you know, I might be a cat. I'm here live, but it's not, I'm not a cat. So here's my guideline for choosing a good course. Number one, a good course covers the majority of topics needed to reach your end goal. If you absolutely know nothing about the skill you're trying to learn, this research phase warrants a decent amount of time in figuring out what it is that you need to learn. 
For example, for data science, I have a video that covers the topics required for data science. And here's another one for coding. There are lots of other videos that cover topics like data science and coding, and honestly, most other topics that you're trying to learn as well. It doesn't hurt to check out a few of these videos as well as other resources like blogs and articles from credible sources. After doing some research by yourself and compiling a list of topics to study, if you can have access to a mentor in the field, it'll be good to just run that list by them just to make sure that the topics covered are up to date and are in fact crucial for achieving your end goal. Quick note about mentors. Generally for this kind of purpose, it's a good idea to choose a mentor that's maybe a couple years further along than you are, as opposed to like the CEO or the director or something. And the reason for this is because you want someone that is still close to the action and is not too far removed from what's happening in the industry today. This is especially true in industries that move extremely quickly, like tech, for example. Besides, the more senior the person is, the further they are from where you are now, and it can be difficult for them to scope down all the knowledge that they have. So yep, if you have access to a mentor, let them do a quick check of your list. My second criterion is arguably not essential, but very nice to have. And that is integrated projects and applied components built into the course itself. This is also what ultra learning refers to as the principle of directness. It means to directly apply what you're learning towards your end goal. So for example, if you're trying to learn how to code, it's far better to practice coding than watching someone code on the screen. The principle of directness also ties in directly with the ultra learning principle of drilling, which means to attack your weakest point and break down complex skills into their component parts, and then focusing and improving these weak points one at a time before assembling everything back together as a whole. Let's keep going with the coding example. By working on a project directly, you realize that there are these gaps in your knowledge or places that you're weak in. So what you do is you improve these areas individually and then you put everything together and then you try the entire process again. For me, when I was learning how to code, one of my weakest spots was thinking through the technical structure of a project or a problem before implementing. I have this thing where I'm quite impatient and I always just think about the code I'm going to write really quickly um, and then I just start coding, right? I just start implementing directly. But what happens quite frequently is just further down the line, I realize that like the way that I structured my code or just like the approach that I'm using is just not good. And then I would spend a lot of time just trying to course correct and just like fix my code. As opposed to if I just spent a little bit more time upfront and thought about the problem at hand a little bit more thoroughly, I could have saved myself a lot more time and, and headache. So this was a weakness for me. So I drilled that specific thing and eventually I got stronger in my upfront problem solving and I guess you can call it like code structuring skills, uh, which I think overall made me a much better programmer. Now imagine if I didn't have a project to work on. I may not even have known I had this weak spot since I might just be like watching someone else code or filling in pieces of code in like st structured code that somebody else already wrote. And I, I may not even have realized that being able to structure my own code and think through how I'm gonna code is even a crucial skill set. I hope what I just explained made sense. The best online courses are those that have well thought out and realistic projects built into them. Of course, you can also supplement your own learning by finding your own projects to do, but that requires a bit more effort and discipline on your part. Because honestly, watching someone else code and then convincing yourself that you now know how to code is far easier than actually finding your own project um, and struggling through it yourself. So just keep that in mind and just whatever it is that you choose to do, remember to not skimp on the projects. I'll save you from my rant on why projects are the best way to learn and just direct you to this video if you're interested in learning more. All right, the third thing to look for in a good online course for you is to make sure that you like the instructor and their voice and presentation style doesn't make you want to smash your face in the wall. I don't think I need to explain this one too much. Uh, basically, if you can't stand the instructor, you're probably going to have a bad time and, and give up. Like for example, if you can't stand my face or you hate cats, then you would probably hate to have me as your instructor. Okay, great. You now have a clear end goal in mind and have found a good course to get started with. Onwards. Now that you're sitting down to start working through the online course, this is where some of the lessons from Four Disciplines of Execution or 4DX comes in. I love the book Ultra Learning for figuring out how to learn best, but the power of 4DX is in actually executing, which is honestly the hardest part. Like seriously, how many times have you had a great plan in mind and then not actually do any of it? The Four Disciplines of Execution are number one, focus on the wildly important. Number two, act on lead measures. Number three, keep a compelling scoreboard. And number four, 
create a cadence of accountability. We've already covered the first discipline of execution, focus on the wildly important. Hopefully you've determined that learning this new skill is something that is wildly important to you as we've discussed in the beginning of this video. And the goal now is to do this online course so you can acquire the skill. If that's not the case, uh, then you should probably reconsider. Number two is act on lead measures. So what is a lead measure or metric? 4DX defines metrics into falling into two different categories, leading and lagging. The lagging metric is what you want to achieve, or in other words, the goal or image that you imagine yourself being able to do with this new skill that you're learning, like becoming a profitable trader, or like coding this web app that you've always wanted to do. Now, lead metrics are activities or sub-goals that can be acted upon and predict the success of your lag metric. This means that if you can just focus on achieving your lead metric, your lag metric naturally gets achieved. So in summary, a good Good lead metric is highly predictive of your lag metric and is something that you can directly influence. In this case of self-study, your lag metric is learning the skill of your dreams and your lead metric is something like covering two topics off the list of topics uh, that we compiled earlier per week. Of course, it doesn't have to be two topics, you can choose your actual schedule. You may notice that I didn't say that the lag metric should be to finish the course and the lead metric is to do two sections of the course a week or something like that. I'll be discussing this more later in the video, but basically you don't want to be married to a single course since your goal is to learn this new skill, not to finish an online course just for the sake of doing that. There'll be times where you want to skip sections in your online course that are not in the core list of topics, and times when you even want to mix in another course or another resource, or even to abandon a course that no longer serves its purpose. You want to have that flexibility and focus on your true goal and have your lead metric reflect that. Third discipline of execution is to keep a compelling scoreboard. What's nice about MOOCs these days is that they generally keep a scoreboard for you, and you actually get these encouraging little banners that motivate you to continue your learning streak for that course. This is quite nice and can be motivating to some people. However, just keep in mind though, and to reiterate, our goal is to try to optimize learning the skill, not completing the course for its own sake. And that's why I, I would also recommend having your own scoreboard that tracks the progress of your lead metric towards your live metric. Your X axis in this case would be like the time and the Y axis is the number of topics covered. Have a goal number as the total number of topics that you need to cover and draw a goal line over time so that you can actually measure your progress. Having this scoreboard should help you a lot because it's so clear whether you're on track or not since your lead metric, aka the number of topics that you need to cover, is something that's within your control. So you basically can't give the excuse of you don't know what your progress is or blame your lack of progress on the weather or something. With that being said, life does happen. And maybe your dog ate your internet box thing and your internet went out for a week. Well, that's a pretty compelling reason, I guess, and it's okay to change your goal line to reflect that. We still gotta be flexible. All kidding aside though, I find that the scoreboard helps a lot in helping me keep on track since it's so clear and simple and also updating it is really easy as well. So it's hard for me to justify procrastinating that. The fourth discipline of execution is creating a cadence of accountability. This can be in many different forms, but what tends to work very well is to use some form of social accountability. For example, having a check-in meeting with a small group of people who are working on similar things. The 4DX book recommends having a non-negotiable meeting held at the same time at least weekly. It also says to keep it short, no longer than 20 to 30 minutes, just to make sure that everybody stays on topic, which is assessing everyone's progress since last meeting and reviewing the scoreboard. Now, if you're thinking, but Tina, I have no friends. Do not worry, come hang out in the Discord channel link in the descriptions. I think there's at least a couple accountability groups that are going on right now and feel free to start another one too. Okay, awesome. You now have a plan and a way of execution. I would say you're mostly set, but as promised, I will now cover how to skip the fluff and things that are not relevant to you in the courses, as well as how to use multiple resources. So in terms of skipping the fluff, Remember your goal and the list of topics that you need to cover. Remember that these are your North Star. A mistake I see a lot of people make, and I've totally made the same mistake as well, many, many times in the past, is, is thinking that you have to follow a course faithfully. I guess it's because of how school usually works, and we're kind of conditioned to think that way, but that's not efficient. Instead, you should pick only the topics that are in that list of crucial topics to cover and actually spend a disproportional amount of time on those. Most courses will have buzzword topics that the instructor kind of glosses over or prolonged introductory topics or generally just topics that are not relevant towards achieving your specific goal. And if that's the case, 
Skip them. Uh, if it makes you feel any better about the FOMO, realize that you can always come back to these in the future if they ever do become relevant. On a similar note, the course you decide to take might not contain all the topics that are crucial, or at least not in the depth that you would like. In that case, you can find another course or resource that goes into these topics to complement your current course. By nature of most online courses being like online video based, it's not the most inherently interactive format. Some courses may teach great information, but don't do the best job in having as many hands-on real-life projects. So a good solution is to also sign up for interactive project-based resources that can complement your online course. For example, for data science, data quest is something to check out or tablet, which is free. The key takeaway here is that you shouldn't be married to one course and feel like you need to complete it. You need to think about learning more flexibly and always think about optimizing for your end goal. Finally, last section is how to take notes. I think this topic deserves its own separate video, so I'm going to be making that video on how to take notes, how to remember things, and all of that in the future. But with respect to online courses specifically, a lot of platforms have places for you to make notes directly on certain timestamps or, or lectures. I personally don't use these features much because you can't download all the notes easily, so you have to either remember where you took notes or make notes on where you took notes, uh, which is not the best, I think. I'm personally more of an analog person and I prefer paper and pen, but you can definitely take notes online or with your favorite note-taking app as well. Whichever way that it is that you decide to take notes, um, I think that you should take notes because at least for me, it helps a lot in keeping me focused or else my brain just kind of like drifts to something else pretty easily. But I don't take copious amounts of notes, especially if it's on technical and applied topics, like coding, for example. I just take notes of the high-level concepts and reference resources or locations of the course to come back to if I need more details in the future. I also like to watch video lectures at two to three times the speed and not pause the videos very often because I find that it helps me keep focused and actively forces me to only write down the most important notes. Finally, after I cover each section of the course, I like to also do active recall, which is when I don't look at my notes or any other resources and kind of just say out loud all the things that were covered in that section in my own words. By the way, this is another ultra learning principle called retrieval and active recall is the recommended approach. Doing the active recall helps a lot in retaining information because the act of synthesizing all that information and recalling it in your own words forces your brain to ingrain that information more deeply and solidify your learning. You can also choose to do active recall by writing it down, but I like saying things out loud because it's a lot faster. Um, and also I don't particularly care if people think I'm insane if I'm doing it in a public location. I guess if that's what you're worried about, you can also hide in a corner and do it. Uh, although I don't know if that would actually make you look less insane or not. All right, there you have it. How to self-study using online courses and how to not give up. By decades of research and science from my favorite books, ultra learning, and four disciplines of execution. I hope this was a useful video for you. I know we covered a lot in this video, so please also let me know if you have any questions or want me to make a video that expands on any of the topics that we covered today. See you in the next video or live stream.